we are going to look at First uh, Peter chapter two. I looked at this together with Connie this morning. First Peter chapter two, beginning with verse four, and reading through verse ten. First Peter chapter two verses four through ten. As you come to him the holy the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now you, to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone and a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobeyed the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Amen. Praise the Lord. A few Sundays ago, most of you probably forgotten by now, because uh, in between there were we had guest speakers, we had our church anniversary, and uh, I, I didn't get a chance to continue the series that I started, and I'm going to continue today. The topic is. I am a Catholic priest, and Peter was not the first pope. I am a Catholic priest, and Peter was not the first pope. Uh, and interestingly enough, we just finished reading First Peter and Second Peter, and those of you that were here on Wednesday, we had a great time uh, answering questions and reviewing the two books that we have read, which was written by Peter. And if Peter is or was the first pope, it's definitely important to hear and to listen to what Peter was saying through the first, I mean, the two books that he wrote. Now, we're going to look at nine reasons why I believe Peter was not the first pope today. But before we get to that, I wanted to remind you of what we said before when we started. The aim of this message is not to attack Catholics. I want to make that clear. The aim of the messages that I'll be preaching is not to attack Catholics. I believe that there are Catholics who are saved. But I also believe there are Catholics who are not saved. In fact, I happen to believe there are more Catholics who are not saved than there are who are saved. And I'll tell you why as we get into this. I also believe there are Baptists who are not saved. Amen. 
I definitely believe there are Baptists at Village Baptist Church who are not saved. And somebody's probably saying, well, you're just judging. Yeah, God told me to judge that way. In fact, in the same passage where God says, thou shalt not judge, he also said, don't give what is holy to dogs. So you have to know what dogs are. You have to use some kind of judgment. And, and I think it is really important also for us as Christians to know that we are not to condemn one another. But God gives us the right to correct one another. Amen. Just because you're being corrected. A lot of people get corrected. They get all bent out of shape and leave the church. Then go to a church where you'll never be corrected. Now, of course, if I see you smoking, there's nothing in the Bible that says thou shalt not smoke. But I'm going to tell you, when you have cancer of the lungs, or you pass disease to other people who are, you know, are getting in all your smoke, don't blame God for your sickness. And it's left to you to decide whether you want to keep on smoking or not. There's nothing absolute. I mean, there's one passage in the Bible that says smoke is bad for the eyes. But there's nothing else in the Bible that tells us that you should not smoke. There's nothing in the Bible that says you should not drink. And I'm not just talking about water. I'm talking about Michelob and Heineken and stout and everything else that you drink. I don't drink not because I'm a Christian. I just drink because I don't like to drink. I came from an alcoholic family. I know when we used to go out and just pick up my uncle off the street. And I don't want anybody to come pick me off the street. That's why I don't drink. I, you know, uh, people tell you, you know, every now and then, can you just drink a little bit? You know, I said, no. I don't want to drink at all. But that does not mean that I should be in judgment over those who drink. Now, if I do see you drunk, I'm going to talk to you. Because I know right away if you're drunk that you've gone against God's word. And if you see your fellow Christian drunk or going to a party where people are sharing marijuana sticks <laughs> you know it's it's really interesting how we 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 uh, explain things the way when we want to do them. You know, people come to it's marijuana. You know, God made it. <laughs> and I say, oh yeah, God made snakes too. Why don't you put one in your pocket? So the point is, we are not saying that people are not saved because we want to pass judgment on them. You're saying people are not saved because their actions betray who they are. And I'll get to that later. Why all these seats are empty. Amen. And people who listen to our radio program go, no, our seats are empty too. They're empty because some people who say they're Christians are not. Some who say they're church members are not. Some of us are Christians only when we don't have trials in our lives. You know, we come to church, hallelujah, everything's going all right. Let something start it. You get fired at job and then they stay home. You are really showing who you are when you are under trial. You're truly a Christian. 
It is. It should be very important to you that you come to church to worship God. One of the commandments, one of the Ten Commandments is what? Now, remember what? The Sabbath day to do what? You don't keep it holy by watching the 49ers play. Anyway, let me get into my message. The only way that a person becomes a Christian is by accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That is the only way you get saved. You don't get saved any other way. You don't get saved because you come to church. Believe me, it is true. And my wife said the next time I give this illustration, she's going to scream. But I'm going to give it again. So watch whether she's going to scream. You don't become a car because you went into the garage. <laughs> She's not screaming. <laughs> Amen. Thank you. <laughs> it's, it's really, you know, because I'm saying it over and over because I want you to get it. You have to get it. You don't become a Christian just because you came to church. God is not happy because you're here today. Some of us could have stayed home and there would be absolutely no difference. Because you come in, you sit down, you go out, you, you haven't done anything. You are a Christian because you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Not just for one day, not just for two weeks, not just for three years, but as long as you live. Jesus is Lord, not when you want him to be Lord. He is Lord because he is Lord all the time. If it has to take a committee to come see you at home about coming to church, you are not a Christian. If you don't like what I'm saying, go join another church. It's the truth. It's the word of God. If you don't like the word of God, you don't belong here. The Bible says, just in case you say, well, he just says the word of God says it. Let me quote it for you. In fact, I'm not going to quote the whole thing, verses 19, Hebrews uh, chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. But it says in 25, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but so much the more as you do what? You see the day approaching. And what was Jesus' custom? As his custom was, he went into the synagogue to worship. If Jesus will go in the synagogue as his custom was, why is it that it takes a whole committee to want to get you to come to church? Now, some of us are going to be shocked if you read Acts chapter 2. And in Acts chapter 2, we are told that the early church worship on Sunday. What, what did they say? Every day. Oh my Lord. How many of us here will still be Christian if you're supposed to come to church every day? And some of us take shifts. I'm a first Sunday Christian. Because on first Sunday they serve communion. And now we're going to confuse you real good. And you come on first Sunday, you don't see the Lord say, what happened to them? Where is the communion table? Where were you last week? I know I'm preaching when you're all quiet. Praise the Lord. 
You are not saved because you are religious. You're not saved because you're a deacon. You're not saved because you're a preacher. You're saved because you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And I wish we understand what the word Lord means. The Greek word kurios. It means to be your boss, to be your master, to be your king, to be your ruler, to be the one that you obey all the time, not just sometimes when you feel like it. That's the lordship of Jesus. If you understand what it meant to the early church, you will know that many of us will not even qualify. Here was the government, Caesar. You got to bow to him as Lord, but the early church said, no, it's not Caesar, it's Jesus. Who is the Lord of your life? Lord of your life. How many people think Jesus is Lord of your lives? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. There are more people out of here than there are people here. Jesus is Lord. It, it's not what denomination you belong to. It's not whether you're Catholic or Baptist or Methodist. There are a lot of unsafe Catholics and there are a lot of unsafe Baptists. There are a lot of unsafe Presbyterians. And there are some churches that are just plainly unsafe. We have a lot of churches now that are just going by what the world says. We don't want to offend anybody. Even if the Bible says it, we just say, well, that was the old time. We have churches now where people are not required to pay tithes anymore. They pay dues and pledges. You won't see the word pledge in the Bible. You won't see the word dues in the Bible. Even though you don't like it, the word that's in the Bible is tithes and offering. And God made it that way because it's the simplest way to give. If God said 3%, we'd all be confused. Try and calculate 3%, 3%. Ten percent is easy. It was ten percent of five hundred thousand? Boom! Just like I just moved the decimal point one place. Amen. Some of you are still trying to tip God. You know you're not tithing. You're lying. Tithing, lying. Well, you know that you know. It's, it's, oh, he's a pastor. It's for his salary and for this, you know. I don't, I don't want to pay that pastor's salary. Then why are you coming to his church? You want to hear his teaching. You want him to bless you. You want him to visit you. You want him to minister to you. But you don't want to take care of him the way God said you should take care of him. The next time you go to your doctor, he gives you a bill. Tell, I don't want to pay you. Not only going to jail, it's going to mess up your credit. <laughs> it's simple. God sent the pastor to serve you, and God tells you how to take care of him. Amen. You have no choice. If you don't want the pastor, go to another church. Maybe you like that pastor. I'm talking about Catholics this morning, but I go sidetracked. And we talked about the reason why I'm saying to you that I don't believe Peter was the first pope. I'm a Catholic priest because I'm a universal priest. That's what the word Catholic means. The word Catholic simply means universal. 
I'm not just a priest when I'm in America. I'm a priest anytime I go back to Africa. I'm a priest when I'm in China. I'm a priest in Japan. I'm a priest in South America. I'm a priest in South Africa. It doesn't matter where I am. I am a priest because my priesthood is not geographically located. Anywhere I am, I am a priest. I am not a Roman Catholic priest. Because being Roman and being Catholic is contradiction in terms. You cannot be Roman and be Catholic. Well, some of you will get it. It is important that we understand this, that we, our priesthood is based upon the Bible. What we teach is based upon the Bible. It's not based on tradition. If it is not in the Bible, it is not something that we should be pushing. So, let's go through the nine points real quick. I think we can do that in about 10, 15 minutes. The first point is, Peter was not the first pope. I already mentioned this, but let me say it again. Because Peter was married. Matthew chapter 8, verses 14 through 15. Matthew chapter 8, verses 14 through 15. And in that passage, uh, we, we were told that Jesus went into the house of Peter's what? Mother-in-law. I can she be mother-in-law if Peter was not married to her daughter. Even though we don't have in the Bible where the, about the children of Peter, but tradition and historians tell, told us that he had three children. So if he was the first pope, then all popes after him should get married. And if they don't get married, being single should not be a requirement for the priesthood. And being single should not be a requirement for being a bishop. Isn't that very clear? Number two, Peter was not a sole leader in the New Testament. In other words, Peter was one of the leaders in the New Testament. Peter was one of the apostles in the New Testament. And Peter himself was evangelized by Andrew. You don't hear too much about Andrew, but Peter would not have been saved if it wasn't for Andrew. John chapter 1, chapter 2. You will see it in there. It was Andrew that led Peter to the Lord. So come we have seen him who the prophets talked about. The Messiah that they're waiting for. And he brought Peter to the Lord. And that was the end of the story. So then if, if uh, Peter was not the sole leader of the church, there was not one person that was ever called the leader of the church. Peter was one of the pillars of the church. That is stated in Acts of the Apostles. It's also stated in the book of Galatians that Peter was one of the pillars of the church. It was recorded by the apostles. And especially if you look at Acts chapter 15, when there was a problem in the church, the problem was about Jews not accepting Gentiles who also have accepted Christ. When the Gentiles came in, the Jews said, wait a minute, what is this happening? How can you be a Christian? You see, today it's not as strange to us to see someone who is not a Jew become a Christian. Remember that most of the disciples of Jesus were Jews. So when people became Christians who were not Jews, it was strange to them. And they said, wait a minute, how can you be a Christian and you're not circumcised? And that became an issue. And that issue had to be settled by the church and they called the council in Jerusalem 
to settle this matter. And if you look at Acts chapter 15, the report of their meeting was stated there. And not only was Peter talking, but James also talked. And in the, the, in the discussion, he said, they all discussed. It wasn't just this at the pillars of the church, this at the leaders of the church. The whole church met. And a decision was made that they should not require Gentiles to be circumcised in order for them to be Christians. They were not saying, well, everybody uh, be quiet, let the Pope speak. I don't have time to read through it, but you read it. Read it when you get home. Read it very carefully and you will see that it was not just one person, not just two people, but the whole of the people of God were involved in the discussion. Now, number three, when you look at Galatians chapter 2, Galatians chapter 2, verse is 11 through 14, and I'm going to read that to you so you can uh, get the whole message in there. Galatians chapter 2 verses 11 through 14. Are you all with me? Okay. When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles but when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his what? Hypocrisy. So that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter, not secretly, but in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law, because by observing the law, no one will be justified. Now, read it carefully. Go over it again. Go over it again. I'm not making it up. This is the word of God. What did Paul say? He said, I corrected him to his face. I told him he was a hypocrite. I told him he wasn't living to the gospel. Now, you tell me, how many people have done that to the Pope? Even when the Pope allows a, lot, a bunch of priests to abuse young children. They don't even have any way of chastising him and telling him he's going to do this and do this because they regard him as close to God. Now, you know this, in Catholic tradition, and I'm not saying anything that's secret, in Catholic tradition, when the Pope speaks ex cathedra, he is on the same level as the Word of God. He is never wrong. A mere man. I said, Peter, you're just a hypocrite. Not only, you're not even living like a Jew.
Now, how many of the, of the New Testament people have you seen the world looking after Peter to kiss his hands? Because if you just, if you just find a way to kiss his hands, you will be just, you just kiss God. Now, Peter was definitely one of the inner circle of Jesus among all other disciples, but he was one of three. When you even talk about the inner circle of those who were with Jesus among his disciples, who were they? Peter, James, and John. Let me go on. Number five. There was no once... Huh? I just gave you four. He was one of the inner circle. I'm sorry. I'm trying to rush because I have five minutes. He was one, definitely one of the inner circle of Jesus. And uh, all the disciples were with him. But Jesus chose three to usually be with him. Especially when he goes out to pray. When he has something important. He had these people to support him. And they were Peter, James, and John. Number five. There was no one single pope in the New Testament. The word Pope simply means Father. And I'm going to talk about that later. The word Pope is the Latin, Latin for Father. Papa. Father. Nowhere in the New Testament was one person ever declared to be the leader of the church. If you look at the New Testament, and I have several passages, we don't have time to read them. Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 5, Colossians chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 2. You read through all that, even Peter himself says Jesus is the only head of the church. We don't have two heads. We don't have one head in Rome and one head in heaven. It's only one. Jesus. And he is the one that you should obey. And how do you obey him? You obey him primarily through the Bible that he has given us. And we'll talk about that also in the next uh, series of uh, uh, sermons. The really interesting question is, Why did we not hear from any of the apostles as Peter being the head of the church? They were there on the island of Caesarea Philippi when Jesus said, You are rock and upon this church I will build my church and I will take one whole set message to talk about Matthew chapter 16 verses 13 through 20 on Peter being the rock. But Peter himself said, Jesus is the rock. Jesus is the living stone. Jesus is the one you should pay attention to, not to him. Number six. Isn't it really interesting? I'm just bringing this point out. There's nothing really unique about it. But for me, it's really interesting that Jesus committed the care of his mother who the Catholics call the mother of God, not to Peter, but to John. You're getting ready to leave the earth, and you want someone to keep your mother, wouldn't you commit your mother to the one you trust the most? The one you think is going to do a good job? The one you think is going to be there for for her? At this time, do you know what? John was there, but Peter was busy denying Jesus. And then, of course, the uh, Catholics, they have a lot of way of explaining this away. But I I want you to, you know, take them at, at it and just read John chapter 19, verses 25 through 27, to see what Peter was doing while John was there and John was given the care of Mary. Number seven. 
Notice the account of the resurrection, and the account is really very interesting. John chapter 20, I'm giving you a lot of assignments, I know. Read John chapter 20, and read the story of the resurrection. And see in there that it wasn't until John chapter 21 that Peter was confronted by Jesus. And in John 21, Jesus confronted Peter not to chastise him for denying him, but to bring him back into fellowship. It's it's a really great example for us, really. Because many of us, If somebody has done something wrong, we just throw them away. I know today, I I had a meeting with uh, uh, a member of village, well, not a member, but someone who's been attending village, who has been in problem with the law and has been in jail and is now on probation. On probation, is that what you call it? When you have to report to a parole officer, and, and it's really interesting. This guy is looking for a job, but, you know, he has paid society. He has gone to prison. He has come out. He's, he's doing, keeping his nose clean and everything. But yet nobody wants to give him a job. And we say, well, it's so terrible. That is the way the world treats people. But even in the church, it's the same. When somebody has done something wrong, oh Lord. They're in our red book. The heart book. We don't say it, but they're in there. And we don't trust them anymore. But Jesus wanted Peter to know, I still need you. I still want you. I'm still going to use you. It doesn't matter that you deny me even before a little uh, girl. If you know what Peter did, you will, you you really will be shocked. Because it was a teenage girl that said, I, you, you sound like one of them. You have an accent. Aren't you with that Galilean? Oh, I don't know him. I don't know him. And then he began to swear up and down. I mean, it wasn't the soldiers who were there saying, Peter, was a little girl. Swear up and down. I don't know him. I don't know him. Oh, oh, yeah, God, I don't know him. You know? Jesus came back and said, I still need you. I still need you. I still want to use you. And you know he used them. If you read Acts chapter 1, chapter 2, you saw the power of Peter when he preached on the day of Pentecost. That is the power of somebody who has experienced forgiveness. I still want you. Frida wrote a song with I still want you. I don't want to mess it up, but you know. I know it says something like that. Huh? You still want me. Okay. I'll give you the idea anyway. <laughs> now, of course, if number, nine, number eight, the message of 1 Peter 2, 9 could not have been written by the first pope. You see, because the Catholic Church believes, they don't believe in the priesthood of all believers. And this passage teaches that all believers are priests. So the Catholic doctrine was a made up doctrine. The hierarchy controls the church. But in this way, Peter said, 
You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, that you may declare the wonderful works of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. In other words, you don't have to be ordained. You don't have to be a deacon. You don't have to be a, a, a Catholic priest, Roman Catholic priest. All you just have to be is a priest, a royal priest, to declare the wonderful works of him who's called you out of darkness into his marvelous earth. Now, please don't get me wrong. I'm not saying there's no place for the ordained ministry. Because there are some who are called by God specifically to do some things for him. And we recognize that by recognizing the hand of God in their lives and ordaining them and setting them apart to do that work. But that doesn't mean all you should do is just come here and sit down. You're a priest and you have work to do. And number nine, the last point, is any words or titles that are used in the church today are not found in the Bible are just man-made. And a very good example is the word Pope. Now, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 23, verse 9 through 10. Matthew 23. Those of you that are tired, this is the last point. Matthew chapter 23, verses 9 through 10. Amen. Who has it? Read it for us. Amen. Now, of course, Catholics have a way of dealing with this. Have you ever, you know, let me tell you a, a good, uh, maybe I told you this story already. Some of you are laughing already when I say, let me tell you a story. <laughs> huh? Oh, okay, before that. But anyway, I was driving in San Francisco one time, and I got to a stoplight. And I don't know why, but for some reason, I dozed off. And... Uh, I must have let up a little bit on the brakes and my car rolled up and hit the car in front of me and it was a very expensive car. And it just so happened that I was wearing my collar because I had just visited somebody in the hospital in San Francisco. And because sometimes when I go to the hospital to visit, I don't want them to tell me it's not visiting hours or whatever. I put on my collar. Once they see my collar, they don't stop me. So that was why I was wearing my collar that, that day. And I rolled into this guy, and I put my car in park, and we came out. And he saw me and said, oh, Father, that's okay. Go. I said, God bless you. <laughs> I didn't tell you. I'm not a father. <laughs> but Jesus specifically said, don't call anybody father. Now, what that means, it doesn't mean, you know, the Catholics deal with this this way. And I've read a lot of Catholic books in including the Catholic Encyclopedia, and they say, well, you, you call your father, father, right? So that wasn't what Jesus meant. You know what Jesus meant. Because people at that time were really involved in titles. One of the titles was rabbi. Rabbi this, rabbi that, rabbi this, and they got all the glory by being called rabbis. Just like a lot of people get glory in being called pastor today. Or reverend. 
Nobody is reverent except God. Amen. But you know what we mean. <laughs> but you see, the point is, Jesus is saying, people are involved in these titles, Rabbi and Father. No, there, you, there's only one Father. And in fact, if you read John chapter 17, that was the Father that Jesus was praying to. He called Holy Father. So when somebody is calling somebody else Holy Father, you are definitely going against the word of God. And Peter will have stopped anybody from calling him Holy Father. Or the way the Catholics say, Holy See. Nobody should be given that title. That title belongs to your Father who is in heaven. Oh, you know what it means. It's not saying Shante shouldn't call me Father, Daddy, or whatever. It doesn't mean Shola shouldn't call me Father or Daddy. I don't even. Only Shante actually calls me Father. <laughs> and I know she wants something. <laughs> and it's the way she says it Father. <laughs> so it's really important when we look at the practices of the Catholic Church when it comes to the Pope it's definitely clear that Peter will have disagreed with everything they have everything not just some but everything because not only do we have his writings to show it we have the other Passages in the Bible, the other books in the Bible that shows what the other apostles believed, what the early church believed, and why we should stay with the Bible instead of staying with tradition. Tradition can get you in trouble. And some people, sometimes with tradition, just believe that preachers should look a certain way, should dress a certain way. And you get in trouble when you submit to the way people think you should look. But the most important thing today, I want you to close your eyes. The most important thing today is, do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? I don't care who the first pope was. I'm not interested in him. And I'm not even interested in the popes that have come after him. And who gives them the right to pass on something to somebody else. I don't care about that. All I'm interested in is do you know Jesus as your Lord and your Savior? If you don't know him as your Lord and Savior... You can be a Catholic three times. You can be a Baptist four times. You can be a Presbyterian five times. You're still going to hell. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. 